I'm, I'm coming around to uh, Odin Validator on a few things on my own project because I, um, I recently was trying to set up a project and I installed a bunch of assets and, you know, got the usual whole pile of yellows and reds. And I was like, ugh. That was from the discussion earlier this week on Odin Validator. And I've been trying to figure out how to get everybody else to come to this same realization. I've been working on this video for a while because it's a pretty advanced topic that I think a lot of even professional game developers don't really know about. They don't know why they would use a tool like Odin Validator, how it works, or that it's extremely easy to get started with with almost no setup. So today I'm gonna explain all three of those things and see if I can convince you too. Let's start with why you would use it. I think that's probably the most important part. If you run into any of these following issues, then the rest of the video will really help you. First, let's look at broken materials. I get this all the time where I've got bright pink objects randomly in my scene, usually because the material's set up for a different render pipeline. Next, we've got missing scripts. If you've got a script that maybe got deleted, changed, or you grabbed an asset that had a missing script on a prefab, this will find it for you and help you fix those automatically. Missing references is another one that I run across all the time where I've got a game object that's trying to reference things like a bullet or object that it wants to spawn, and then that prefab reference disappears and now it's missing. I go to play and I'm getting errors again. Invalid references also happen quite often where I grab something from the scene like a bullet that I've placed out into the scene was working on, drop that in as a reference, and then I deleted it later, and hey, that's probably where my missing references are coming from too. Both of those scenarios can be easily fixed with validator. There are some other things though, null things in lists, this happens to me all the time, where I have a list of objects and I delete one, but forget to remove it from the list. Invalid layers, another one that you'll definitely run into a lot if you're using a lot of assets. Duplicate components, which also kind of happens there, but it happens a lot for me when I just accidentally add a component twice or add something to a prefab and then apply the changes and suddenly I've got two of my player on my player object and everything's breaking. Or missing materials, shader errors, missing scenes from your build settings, empty strings, or even way offset positions that are invalid. You got something that accidentally got thrown way, way off into a crazy position, or simple things like objects floating above the ground. That's a big list already, and that's just some of the things that Odin Validator will automatically find. And when it does, it also gives you a nice little button to bulk fix all of these issues instantly. Let's take a quick look at how we use Validator to fix things with a single click or two. First, materials. If your materials are broken, you need to just select the correct shader for them and then hit the fix button. Most of the time I can just select all of them, pick the standard shader or whichever shader is correct, and then hit the button without having to dig through and find all of the broken materials. It's a great time saver and I really love that one. Missing and invalid scripts can also automatically be removed, though I like to take a kind of closer look at those to see what's going on and why that script is missing. Usually it's missing intentionally but sometimes there's an issue there and I want to make sure that I don't just automatically remove all of them. So that's one of the few things that I don't just instantly bulk fix. What about missing references though? How could it know what's missing and what's just like an empty public field? Well, it's pretty simple. You just add the required attribute to any field and validator will automatically alert you when it's empty. There's also a required in attribute that'll allow you to only require things if it's a prefab or if it's a scene object, but I usually just go with the required attribute and then I mix in some other attributes like assets only that prevents me from accidentally dragging a scene object or a child where I wanted to have a prefab reference. But speaking of children, another one I use often is the child game objects only. This one I use for things like transform offsets for holding things like weapons and items. It just makes sure that the object I've assigned is actually a child and I also occasionally use things like the scene objects only attribute when I have objects that interact with other objects in a scene like switches and doors. All right, let's pause for a second now. Some of you are probably thinking, this is cool, but I could write this all myself. You could write a couple attributes, maybe add a build step to check them, or maybe use on validate. And you could. I've done that before on some of these, but it's really time consuming to build and manage, and it just gets slow. It starts off kind of fast, but when you start validating a bunch of data and your project gets bigger, the editor starts kind of freezing and my workflows kind of fall apart when I do it that way. Usually when I've done that, I end up disabling things or commenting stuff out and on validate. And my validation is kind of haphazard and just barely happening. This is why Odin Validator is different. They built it to solve that problem. It runs all of the validation in the background without impacting my actual development process. 
When something changes, the validator will just notice it and scan it as soon as there's some extra CPU time, and then it'll get an alert in the validator window without freezes, hanging, or, again, needing to write any code. If you want to try it out, though, and see just how fast and smooth the process is, I'll make sure to have a link down below so you can go grab the free trial version. Once you do grab it, run the setup wizard. I leave the settings on default. They're easy to change later if you want, but the defaults are a good start. You open the validator window from the menu bar up here. In an empty project, you'll see a welcome message. And if you opened one of your real projects, you should see a nice list of things to actually fix. If you don't see anything, you can force a scan with the play button right here. And this fast forward looking button will speed it up even more by running the validation in the foreground instead. If you do it this way, it will stop you from working while it's running, but I rarely use this button. And when I do, it's only still a couple seconds that it locks up for. Most of the time, I just let it scan in the background though and find errors as I create them. When I pull in a character using the wrong render pipeline or break a prefab reference or place something floating above the ground, I know right away and I can fix it usually with a single click. That ground one is something we need to talk about though, so hang on, we'll get to that in just a minute. So far, most of the validators I've talked about were attribute validators, things like required, child game objects only, and assets only, but there are a few other validator types that are really helpful. Value value uh, value value uh, value validators let you create global rules across your game data. The example they show in their documentation validates all strings to make sure that no forbidden words are used anywhere. Root object validators are the ones you use if you want to custom validate content like scriptable objects or prefab components. When you create the validator, you tell it what type of object to validate and it'll run your validation code against all of them. Their example in the documentation is an item scriptable object, and I can see some more complicated rules for that making sense there, but most of the time I find that the attributes handle what I want to do, and I don't end up actually needing to write any code. One validator type I use a lot, though, is the scene validator. Writing scene validators feels a lot like writing a unit test for an actual scene, except it's extremely easy. You create a class that inherits from scene validator, then override the validate method. And there you can do whatever you want to make sure that the scene's valid. One of the most common things I do with them is make sure objects that I need to be in the scene are actually there. Sometimes when I'm building games, I have things like a game manager that exists in every scene. And one of the biggest problems I've had with this setup is that sometimes the game manager will have overrides in one scene that I don't realize are there. And suddenly I'm like debugging and something that was actually just caused by an accidental override. Or sometimes the game manager is just not in a scene at all and I need it to be there. I've got to go re-grab it and re-add it in there. Now I use this simple game manager validator script to make sure that every scene has a game manager and that it has no overrides. That issue doesn't happen nearly as often as the grounding one though. So let's talk about grounding real quick. Typically when I'm placing things in a scene, I try to use the built-in vertex snapping. If you haven't tried that, just hold V when you move objects around in 3D space and you can make it snap a specific vertex to another vertex on the things you're placing it on. This works great when I'm actually placing things, but things get moved, the ground gets deformed, sometimes other people place things, and sometimes I just forget to properly snap it down. I used to write a grounded script to fix this. It would move everything to the ground if it failed a grounded raycast in on validate, and it mostly worked, but occasionally it would move objects I didn't expect, and it was slow, and on top of that, I really had no idea when it was actually running. When it did move an object I wasn't expecting, things would be in weird, bad positions, and I wouldn't even know that it had moved them. Now what I do instead is write a root object validator, and I move my grounded logic over to that. The root object validator has a lot of really cool benefits, and we'll take a look at those in just a second. But first, let's take a look at the anatomy of a root object validator. You'll see here that we've got our public class, grounded validator, and it's a root object validator for the type of grounded. So I reuse that script, and I just comment out all of the actual on validate logic. Inside of the grounded validator, we have a validate method that's overridden. This is part of the root object validator, and it's the thing that you're going to override to actually use the validator. You'll put data into this validation result if there are any errors or issues or things that you want to notify yourself of or have the, the validator deal with for you. Down here on line 15, we get the actual object. Here you'll see that grounded is a grounded object. That's this 
class right here, and we just use this dot object, or you could just use object, just trying to be very explicit where this is coming from. This is part of the root object validator. This is the object that is being validated. Here we have the same logic that we had for validating a check or doing a ground check. We just do a quick overlap circle to see if there's any ground below us. And if not, instead of just snapping to the ground, which is this part right here on line 29 through 31, we add a validation result that has a type of error and it has a message saying that this game object's name is not on the ground. Then we add a fix using the dot with fix syntax. This will allow us to automatically or manually fix these things in the inspector. You'll see that in just a second. The fix does exactly what we did before, like I just said doing that raycast to snap us down to the ground. And then finally down here on line 34, before we have our semicolon, we have the set selection object, which will allow us to select this object when we click on it in our validation results. Let's take a look. Here's a yellow switch I've moved up above the ground and you can see that now I've got a button here to fix it. There's an execute button that'll snap it back down. If I move multiple laser switches up, you'll see them start to appear down here in the inspector and I can click on them because of that set selection object. I can also go to the bulk fix menu and then hit execute to snap them all down. This is one of the coolest parts. Now I don't have to worry about it running automatically or running on its own. I can just completely control it. I can bulk run them, run them one at a time or on a build or however I want. Now I have complete control over when and where it runs. Speaking of complete control, I can even control which scenes it runs against. If I use the filter assets tab, I can make it only run against my open scenes, just the ones in the build options or pick from a list of specific ones that I want. I can also exclude or include specific folders in my project, like my third party assets for my plugins or assets. If I don't want those to be validated, I can leave them out. There are two more important things that I want to mention for anyone who's considering using the validator, especially if you're thinking about writing custom validators. First is to make sure to look into the iSelf validator. It's an interface that you can use in any mono behavior to add the validation directly to that component. It's not something I use heavily because I prefer having the validation separated, but it's really handy and very easy to use. It feels a lot like using on validate, but getting the results in a nice list with automatic fixes and without killing performance. And the second is the distinction between validators and validation rules. When you write a custom validator at the top, you'll add an attribute that's either register validator or register validation rule. And the difference here is that the validation rules are toggleable from settings and they can even include some custom settings that you can adjust per profile. If you do make your validator into a validator rule, just make sure that you actually turn it on. These custom validators can really do a lot. I'm finding new ways to use them almost every day. Just last week, I was using them to fix problems with my space station setup. It was auto-generating and I'd end up with some end corridors that weren't quite right and some invalid data and I was able to quickly fix that right up with a simple validator. And now whenever I run into a recurring issue in my pipeline, I'm looking to see if a simple validator will help me fix it like all the built-in ones did. I'm curious though, were you convinced like Jason's story? And if so, what was it you were most excited about? Just let me know. And if you haven't tried it out yet, grab the free trial down below and try out the built-in validators. If one of them makes a big difference for you like they did for me, then let me know that too. All right, see you in the next one. Oh, before we go, the Unity Awards just popped up for 2023. And if you're a big user of Odin and Validator, then please make sure that you go nominate them and vote for them. And feel free to vote for me if I end up in there too. I don't expect to, but who knows. Anyway, see you in the next video. Bye.